All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce John Reese, who is an independent writer and researcher specializing in the common soldier experience during the war for American independence and North American soldiers food from 1755 to the modern area. So probably pretty good that we're having John right after lunch, as we all did just eat. Uh, for 15 years, John served as military food columnist for the quarterly newsletter Food History News and is written for various publications from the Oxford Encyclopedia of American Food and Drink to the Journal of the American Revolution. His first book, They Were Good Soldiers, African Americans Serving the Continental Army, 1775 to 1783, was published in 2019. So we welcome John as he discusses the research of these good soldiers. Well, it's, uh, it's really good to be here. Um, when I think of uh, misconceptions of the American Revolution, uh, I think the poster child is the subject of uh, African Americans during the war. Uh, so hopefully we can uh, touch a little bit on that. Okay, doke. In a relatively short time, uh, I hope to give some idea of African Americans' experiences as Continental Army soldiers. Along the way, I'll share the stories of several individuals, take a look at how soldiers of color were treated and add all together some insights into their numbers. I'll close with a portion of the only known still existing letter written by a revolutionary black soldier to his wife. Now, before I go into the main portion of my talk, I wanna mention two of the three largely all black regiments that served in the war, for, in the war for, of the revolution. I'll speak of the third later, uh, the segregated American uh, first Rhode Island regiment. Uh, the earliest uh, segregated regiment was the Loyalist Ethiopian Regiment, uh, formed in 1775 with freed slaves, mostly from Virginia, by rural governor John Murray Earl of Dunmore. That unit was disbanded after one year. Six months later, in March 1777, British Commander-in-Chief Sir William Howe directed that all Negroes, mulattoes, and other improper persons who've been, who've been admitted into Loyalist Corps be immediately discharged. So at that point, uh, African Americans could not serve in Loyalist Corps, un Corps under arms, though they did so as musicians and servants and wagoners. For three years after that order, armed, armed Blacks were not allowed to serve in Crown established Loyalist regiments. In March 1779, the French military formed the Chasseur Volontaire de Saint Domingue, thing, formed in what later became known as Haiti. The regiment was formed of both free and enslaved Black men. The latter were promised the freedom in return for military service. The first action was at the siege of British held Savannah, Georgia in autumn 1779, and the unit was disbanded in 1783. Now back to the Continental Army. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. When those words were made public in 1776, Africans had been enslaved in British North America for almost 160 years, and African Americans had been fighting 14 months for the cause of American independence in the Continental Army, Navy, and States Militia. Not for another 89 years was slavery, slavery in the United States leaded. At the onset of the War for Independence, approximately 500,000 African Americans lived in the colonies, of, some, of whom some 450,000 were enslaved. Blacks fought in provincial regiments prior to the war and roughly 5,000 African-American soldiers and sailors, free and slave, served the revolutionary cause. While accurate numbers are hard to come by, the American population at the time was approximately some 2.1 million. Free Blacks comprised 2.4% of the overall population and slaves formed 21.5%. Black soldiers' motivation for joining the Continental Army and their treatment while serving are important to any discussion of their military experience. The reasons for joining largely mirror those of their fellow white and Indian soldiers. Many fought for national independence and hoped for opportunities in a new country. Some, perhaps many, joined for the adventure of military service, sometimes connected to the prospect of serving alongside family or friends. Others were at least partly enticed by the lure of an enlisted bounty or regular pay. And if the idea is espoused in the Declaration of Independence, some fought for their own freedom or for that of their loved ones. Forced service was another factor. If they were in the militia roles, both white and black men periodically faced the chance of being drafted for a short-term stint in a continental regiment. Whites were occasionally compelled to enlist, but enslaved African-Americans were more often coerced or forced by their masters to serve. Many, especially in New England, were promised freedom in return. Most of those promises were honored, but some veterans were kept in bondage. 
Of course, the major dividing line between white and black common soldiers was the American system that enslaved 90% of the country's African Americans and treated black citizens as second class citizens. I'm sorry, free blacks, second class citizens. A remarkable result of my research on black continental soldiers is finding that they largely received the same considerations as their white comrades. At the most basic level, soldiers of color, both African and Native Americans received the same pay, provisions, clothing, and equipment as white soldiers. As regards all those things, both whites and soldiers of color suffered together in times of scarcity and times of bounty. The most glaring case of unequal treatment was that black soldiers were largely barred from serving in any rank other than drummer, fifer, or private soldier. Further, in the early war years, they were occasionally given labor details more often than white soldiers, but that ended by the conflict's middle years. In the end, there may have been difficulties due to officers or fellow soldiers, personal or race animus, but to my knowledge and research, such instances were few and far between. Um, to, to cement this point, uh, one late war incident is telling. A white Rhode Island soldier, Abner Simmons, recalled in 1780 when the two remaining black regiment companies were joined with an integrated Rhode Island levy regiment. Simmons wrote, Captain Elijah Lewis commanded the black company, which was actually two companies, which took post on the right of the levy regiment. That they formed the right of the regiment is noteworthy as according to 18th century military etiquette, etiquette that was a place of honor. In this case, it was accorded to two segregated black companies uh, to the right of a largely all white uh, levy regiment. Now for a, an overview of early service. Black Americans were in the fight from the first. Mil Massachusetts militia of men of color, free and enslaved, fought alongside their white comrades from Lexington to Concord and back to Boston on April 19, 1775. To date, we have the names of 35 black men present that day, at least 18 seeing combat. One, Prince Estabrook was wounded with Captain John Parker's company on Lexington Green. It's likely that as many as 40 to 50 African-Americans were with the militia on the war's first day. Two months later, at least 88 black and 15 Indian soldiers are known to have served at the Bunker Hill battle. One historian estimates that the total may have been as high as 150, roughly 5% of American troops involved. There are several accounts of black participation in those early actions, but this is my favorite, speaking to the courage and resilience of, American Af Af of African American soldiers and the effect one man's determination had on another. John Greenwood, a white soldier, noted of that day, everywhere the greatest terror and confusion seemed, prevail seemed to prevail. As they ran along the road leading to Bunker Hill, it was filled with chairs and wagons, bearing the wounded and dead. Never having beheld, beheld such a sight before, I felt very much frightened. I could positively feel my hair stand on end. Just as they came near the place, a Negro man, wounded in the back of his neck, passed me and his collar being open and he not having anything on except his shirt and trousers. I saw the wound quite plainly and the blood running down his back. I asked him if it hurt much and he said no, that he was only going to get a bandage put on it and meant to return. You cannot conceive the, what encouragement this immediately gave me. I began to feel brave and like a soldier from that moment and fear never troubled me afterward during the, whole, during the entire war. Salem Poor stands out among the many involved in the Bunker Hill battle. He was lauded for his actions that day and was honored for a testimonial signed by Colonel William Prescott, commander of the Bunker Hill Redoubt, and 13 officers from five different regiments. The document was addressed to the Honorable General Court of the Massachusetts Bay, and it reads, quote, <clears throat> the, subscri the subscribers begged leave to report to your Honorable House, which we do in justice to, to the character of so brave a man that under our own observation, we declare that a Negro man called Salem Poor of Colonel Fry's regiment in the late battle of Charlestown behaved, behaved like an experienced officer as well as an excellent soldier. To set forth the particulars of his conduct, conduct would, would be tedious. We would only beg leave to say in the person of this Negro centers a brave and gallant soldier. The reward due to so great and distinguished a character we submit to the Congress, Cambridge, December 5th, 1775. <clears throat> Unfortunately, we, uh, Congress never uh, saw fit to uh, give him any reward for his uh, service. Um, and we don't know what Poor did to earn that, uh, that encomium. Inconia, um, but uh, George Quintal notes, um, quote, it is a strong but unsubstantiated local tradition in Andover that he shot 
Lieutenant Colonel, Colonel James Abercrombie of the Grenadiers, the highest ranking British officer to have been killed that day. To have performed this act, Salem Port would have had <clears throat> to remain in the front ranks in the redoubt probably much longer than was prudent. Despite their proven ability, African Americans were early on deemed unfit for military service. The May 1775 Massachusetts Provincial Resolution stated that no slaves to be admitted into this army upon any consideration, whatever. By contrast, an October 1775 Council of Officers agreed unanimously to reject all, slave, all slaves and by the great majority to reject Negroes altogether. On November 12, Army orders directed neither Negroes, boys unable to bear arms, nor old men, old men unfit to endure the fatigues of the campaign are to be enlisted. Signaling a change of policy at the end of December, General George Washington told of numbers of free Negroes who were desirous of enlisting, giving leave to the recruiting officers to entertain them. And now as a note, uh, were never evicted from the army and continued to serve during this eight month paper exercise of deciding if they should be soldiers or not. Given the desperate need to fill Continental regiments, Washington's decree was generally adopted and the American army re remained a racially integrated organization to the war's end. And black musket bearing soldiers, Continentals and militia fought in every major battle of the war and if most, if not all of the lesser actions. A number of Americans noted the fact of African Americans in, in the ranks, some unfavorably with the claim they were unsuited to be soldiers. The positive remarks were in the, were in the majority. In response to John Adams' October 1775 question about black soldiers in the Massachusetts regiments, Adams called them unsuitable for service. General William Heath replied, there are in the Massachusetts regiments some few lads and old men, and in several regiments, some Negroes. He was prevaricating here because there were actually quite a few Negroes in the Massachusetts regiments. Such is also the case of the regiments from the other colonies. Rhode Island has a number of Negroes and Indians. Connecticut has fewer Negroes, but a number of Indians. The New Hampshire regiments have less of both. The men from Connecticut, Connecticut I think, in general, are rather stronger than those of either of the other colonies, but the troops of our colony are robust, agile, and as fine fellows in general as you would ever wish to see in the field. Uh, Massachusetts General John Thomas was more emphatic. He wrote, in the regiments at Roxbury, the privates were equal to any that I served with last war. Very few old men in the ranks, very few boys. We have some Negroes, but I look on them in general equally serviceable with other men for fatigue and inaction. Many of them have proved themselves brave. Europeans were also complimentary. In December 1777, the German officer wrote of the American Revolutionary Forces, the Negro can take the field in his master's place, hence you never see a regiment in which there are not a lot of Negroes, and there are well-built, strong, husky fellows among them. And the Baron Ludwig von Klosen, aide-de-camp to French General Rochambeau, wrote in July 1781, I had a chance to see the American army man for man. It is really painful to see those brave men almost naked with only some trousers and little than jackets, most of them without stockings, but would you believe it very cheerful and healthy in appearance? It is incredible that, incredible that soldiers composed of men of every age, even of children of 15, of whites and blacks, unpaid and rather poorly fed, can march so fast and withstand fire so steadfastly. As for numbers close and claimed, a quarter of Washington's army were Negroes, merry, confident, and sturdy. Now, regarding Closen's estimate of numbers, my research indicates that while the proportion of Black Continentals likely increased in the late war years, in 1781, they were more likely about 8 to 10 percent of the Army. So now we'll, we'll look a bit more into numbers. In August 1778, a tally was made of the number of Black soldiers in 15 brigades of General George Washington's main army. There were 755 African Americans in a force totaling almost 21,000 rank and file, corporals, music, and private soldiers, making them 3.6% of the whole. Now, while that proportion may seem small, by themselves, black soldiers would form two understrength regiments, each equal to or larger in size than most other serving continental regiments. We also have to recall that free blacks form 2.4% of the overall American population. So even considering numbers of slaves who served, free African Americans were well represented as regards military service. The New Jersey and Rhode Island regiments are not represented on the 1778 return. The number of blacks serving in, the New, in New Jersey's four continental regiments in 1778 was only 10. Rhode Island had just reconstituted one of its regiments, the first filling it with African-American and Indian private soldiers, mostly former slaves, but also about 55 veterans. In August, 1778, 
the first Rhode Island contained 188 black privates, adding those men would bring the total of African-American soldiers that month to 953. So using those numbers, uh, we can, we can uh, figure out the percentages uh, per brigade. Here are the six brigades reporting the highest proportions of black soldiers on August 1778 return. As you can see, there are three from New England and three from Southern states. Uh, by comparison, the middle states of New Jersey and Pennsylvania had very few black soldiers. Um, one Pennsylvania brigade had only uh, one black soldier, uh, actually I think two, uh, the, the other Pennsylvania brigade uh, had none at all. And as you can see, these brigade percentages are all higher than the 15 uh, brigade proportion of 3.63%. So we have Parsons, Connecticut with 9.31%, Mulesburg, Virginia, 6.88%, and Patterson, six point, uh, Massachusetts, 6.3%. Uh, um, this can actually actually go towards the, probably another misconception during uh, of, of the Revolutionary War, which is that there were uh, large numbers of Black servings in uh, Southern regiments as well as Northern regiments, um, and that the Middle States regiments uh, had very few African Americans at all. Playing around some more, um, we can figure the, uh, the average per regiment. Um, and again, here are the highest. Uh, Parsons, Connecticut had 37 black soldiers uh, per regiment. Um, each regiment had eight companies. So we don't know if those soldiers were apportioned uh, among the companies or whether they were all gathered in one company, but there was, there was not enough soldiers uh, to mostly to form one company unless it was an understrength company. Um, the North Carolina Brigade had 29 black soldiers per regiment and Patterson's Massachusetts 22.25 uh, black soldiers. So here we have a modern image of a single company of Henley's additional regiment in 1779, uh, courtesy of the Museum of the American Revolution in Philadelphia. It's a good representation of how many Continental companies would have appeared with some having a, a few more black soldiers and others, none at all. To reiterate, the proportion of African-American soldiers may be considered rather small, but that's not as important as their mere presence in mixed regiments. One reason is the equation of military service with citizenship, citizenship a concept that continued into the mid 19th century. More importantly, foreign observers and others likely consider African-Americans serving alongside white soldiers as a radical revolutionary statement, almost on a par with the Declaration of Independence and taking up arms against the King's army. It may have been an unintentional and to some an unwelcome political statement, but it was just as powerful as the purposeful and just as pragmatic arming of blacks during the 1860s American Civil War. So from numbers, let's turn to uh, two individual soldier stories. Uh, these come from veterans 19th century pension narratives, which historian John C. Dan called one of the largest oral history projects ever, ever undertaken. Um, and my book is centered around uh, those pension uh, narratives. Jacob Francis was born in New Jersey and eventually served in the Massachusetts Continental Regiment for one year. And then in New Jersey militia from 1777 to the war's end. Francis was born in January 1754 and testified, when I was of age, I was bound as an indentured servant by my mother, a colored woman, to one Henry Wambell in, in Amwell. Now he was indentured, but not enslaved. Uh, indentures have a, have a fixed time. Um, his indenture was sold to three other masters and eventually at a little over 13 years of age, he was sold to Joseph, uh, his indenture was sold to Joseph Saxton, who took him to New York then to an island in the Caribbean, and then back to Salem, Massachusetts, where he was sold one more time. In January 1775, his indenture ended, having served as last master for, according to Francis, six years and until I was 21 years of age. Still living in Salem, Jacob Francis enlisted in autumn 1775 for one year in Sergeant's 16th Continental Regiment, belonging to Massachusetts. During that term, he served at the Boston siege and witnessed the battles of Long Island and White Plains. A short time after the fall of Fort Lee on the New Jersey side of the Hudson River, Francis and his comrades marched across New Jersey, crossed the river into Pennsylvania, and then marched down to camp off from the Delaware River a few miles below Coriolis Ferry and above House Ferry, where we lay, we lay there a week or two. In his pension application, Jacob quite accurately described the 26 December 1776 attack on the Hessians at Trenton, New Jersey. He wrote, we received orders to march and Christmas night crossed at the Delaware River down to Trenton early in the morning. We entered, entered the west end of the town. General Washington came into the north end of the town. 
We marched down the street from the river road into the town to the corner where it crossed the street, running out towards the Scotch road and turned up that street. General Washington was at the head of that street coming down towards us and some of the Hessians were between us. And there we had the fight and the principal firing was. After about half an hour, the firing ceased. General Lord Sterling rode up to Colonel Sargent and we were ordered to follow him down through the town toward Assenpink Creek and crossed to the north side of it, where we formed in line in view of the Hessians who were paraded on the south side. Being hemmed in, the Hessians surrendered, grounded their arms and left them there and marched down to the old ferry below the Assenpink, where they, ferry, where they were referred to the Pennsylvania side to the river of the Delaware. Uh, Private Francis soon ended his Continental Army career, uh, being discharged at Trenton soon after, soon after the battle. The remainder of Francis's lengthy deposition recounts his militia career, too long, uh, while it's too long to recount here, he did state, I always went out when I came my, my turn to the end of the war. I went out once as a substitute for, for a person who could not and gave me $45 Continental money to take his place. Now, a side note, um, and it's actually indicative of uh, some of the wonderful material you can come across in the pension files. In 1789, Jacob Francis struck another small blow for freedom. Former slave Phyllis Duncan testified she was present and saw Mary Francis married to Jacob Francis by Cato Finley. At the time of said marriage, Phyllis and Mary Francis and Cato Finley all lived with and were the slaves of Nathaniel Hunt that the marriage took. Jacob Francis immediately after his marriage bought Mary from her master, Nathaniel Hunt. Mary in a few days left the employee of Hunt and went with her husband have, and have ever since that time lived together as man and wife up until the death of Jacob and have raised and raised a family of children. So here we turn from the nor uh, 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 Northern campaign or Middle States campaign uh, down to uh, um, a bit on the Southern campaign. Of all the Black Virginia Continentals found from my study, perhaps the most varied career. In his pension testimony, Pebbles noted he didn't recall the year he enlisted being a poor unlearned mulatto. But according to, to his military, military records, it was December, or September 15, 1777. He testified that he joined the camp at Valley Forge and was placed under the command of Captain Lewis Booker, 11th Virginia Regiment, for two years. At Trenton, he served one year in the artillery under Captain William Miller. Miller First Continental officers were basically uh, laborers for the guns. Uh, he continued. He served for two years under Captain Michael Rudolph of Maryland in the Light Company, Light Infantry, commanded by Colonel Harry Lee, uh, who was Henry Lee, father of Robert E. Lee, whose command was com composed of infantry and cavalry, cavalry, and known as Lee's Legion. He was in three general actions at Monmouth, Guilford Courthouse, and at Utah Springs. At Utah Springs, he received three wounds. He was wounded in the shoulder slightly, lost the thumb of his left hand, and was bay bayoneted in the belly. He was discharged on Combahee River honorably. That's in South Carolina. The day before he was discharged, he was in the battle in which Colonel John Lawrence, who was commanded, who commanded in the absence of Colonel Lee, was killed, 27 August, 1782. Pebbles too, though a free man, had to deal with the issue of slavery post-war. In his pension, he testified, by occupation, I'm a miller. From the infirmities of old age, increased by the wounds received in the Revolutionary War, I'm not able to render, render much service to my employer. I am a free mulatto. My wife and child who live at the mill, where I do, are slaves. My wife's name is Rachel, aged between 15 and 60 years, and my child's name is Ursula, aged 11 years. Now, several other Virginia veterans, veterans told of enslaved family members when they applied for the pensions in the early 19th century. Thomas Mahorny was a planter on a little farm, not his, and is rendered, rendered unable to pursue it by reason of his age and infirmity. His family resided with him are as follows, his wife, Mama, and his son, Jack, both of which are slaves. He being a free man of color who served in the War of the Revolution and is unassisted by the family. And Drury Scott, 10th Virginia Regiment, noted, my occupation is that of a rough carpenter, but I can get but little work. And if I had more, I could not do it. My wife is all my family, but being a slave can render me no assistance. From here, we'll turn to the only American uh, segregated, segregated uh, regiment, uh, not unit. There were a few, very few uh, segregated companies within regiments, um, but this is the only segregated American regiment. The unit most associated with 
African-American revolutionary soldiers is the so-called Black First Rhode Island Regiment. In reality, it existed as such only from March 1778 to June 1780, two years and three months. It was never large enough to form a full regiment and because of that never served with Washington's main army until after the unit joined the second Rhode Island in 1781 when they were consolidated to form the single Rhode Island Regiment. While detailed discussion would take too much time, let's have a brief look at events before and soon after the first Rhode Island Regiment became the only segregated Continental Regiment. Little is certainly known, known of African-American numbers in the 1775 and 1776 Rhode Island regiments, but Massachusetts General William Heath's 1775 letter noted, the regiments, regiments of Rhode Island have a number of Negroes and Indians. And those numbers only increased as the war went on. All the Rhode Island regiments from 1775 through 1777 contained black soldiers serving alongside their white comrades. In other words, were integrated regiments. With the Continental Army's 1777 rebirth, only the 1st and 2nd Rhode Island regiments remained, recruited with men enlisted or re-enlisted for, for three years of the duration of the war. On October 22, 1777, the two Rhode Island regiments, supported by artillery, success successfully defended Fort Mercer against a brigade of Hessian troops. Again in 1777, we must remember the first and second Rhode Island regiments were integrated organizations with white, black, and Indian soldiers serving side by side. Five days after the Fort Mercer, Fort Mercer battle, the two regiments numbered 369 musicians and privates. That total included 65 African-American soldiers. At that point, black soldiers amounted to 17.5% of the Rhode Island regiments rank and file strength, far, far larger than any proportion on the August 1778 return. Uh, and I think if I remember correctly, I think the highest proportion on that return was 9.3% uh, uh, for, uh, for one of the brigades. The Rhode Island regiments were particularly hard hit during the 1777 campaign and the state had to reconsider, had to consider how to re recruit them. General James Varnum recommended in January 1778 the time was raised in Rhode Island. That February, the state legislature resolved that any Negro, mulatto, or Indian man slave in the state might enlist in either of the two battalions to serve during the continuance of the war. It was eventually determined that these recruits, recruits would join only the 1st Rhode Island Regiment, and that unit would contain only Black or Native American privates with white commissioned officers, sergeants, and corporals. Governor Nicholas Cook noted in late February, the number of slaves in the state is not great but it is generally thought the 300 and upwards will be enlisted. Any slaves accepted received their freedoms and their owners were remunerated. Unpopular with many residents, in early May, the legislature set a June 10, 1778 cutoff date for slave recruiting, though free blacks could continue to enlist. And despite Governor Cook's assurances, at best less than 150 African-Americans ever joined the 1st Regiment and was never able to form a full battalion for service with Washington's main army. While the 1st Rhode Island Command Staff was recruiting their slaves in their home state, the regiment's enlisted personnel remained at Valley Forge and were incorporated into the 2nd into the second Rhode Island Regiment. Uh, both were, uh, it was, uh, it was actually, um, yes, the, the, um, the remaining enlisted personnel were, uh, were incorporated into the 2nd Rhode Island Regiment, Rhode Island Regiment, uh, with the exception of a single segregated company uh, still belonging to the first Rhode Island. Um, that was Captain Thomas Arnold's uh, large company, 60, 60 privates by spring 1778. Um, while that company remained at Valley Forge and with the main army, it, it fielded with Colonel Israel Angle's second Rhode Island. So this is actually a, a little known story. Um, while the segregated first Rhode, Rhode Island Regiment was being formed in uh, Rhode Island uh, in 1778. Um, the main regiment never joined the army at Forge, but a, a single segregated company belonging to the regiment filled with veteran soldiers, uh, veteran black and Indian soldiers um, served with Washington's army and took part in the campaign at Monmouth. When Washington's forces confronted the British at the June 28, 1778 Battle of Monmouth, Captain Arnold's black company marched to Monmouth Courthouse with Varna's brigade and Charles Early in the action, having attacked the British rear guard, these men retreated in the face of superior forces, withdrawing towards General Washington's 
marching troops. Meeting the main army's van, General Lee encountered Washington, who placed Lee in charge of an ad hoc holding action. Lieutenant Colonel Jeremiah only described their Rhode Island troops during the ensuing defense. After retiring something more than a mile, General Barnum's brigade was ordered to halt and formed by a cross fence to cover two pieces of artillery, which were in danger of being lost. We there exchanged about 10 rounds and were then obliged to retire with, with considerable loss, but not until the enemy had outflanked us and advanced with charged bayonets to the fence by which we had formed. Our brigade suffered more than any that was engaged. The enemy did not pursue us far on our retreat, observing our army formed on the heights in our rear. Now, this was one of the, the one of the really hard fought actions during the Battle of Monmouth. Um, Captain Arnold's leg was amputated as a result of his wound in the action, and one of Arnold's men, Richard Rhodes, related in the 19th century, he's very much crippled in one arm in consequence of a wound received at the Battle of Monmouth. He was born in this country and sold as a slave and enlisted in the Black Regiment to obtain his freedom. Arnold's company joined the first Rhode Island in July 1778. The Black Regiment went on to see combat at the August 1778 Battle of Rhode Island and remained in their home state until marching into New York to be consolidated with the second regiment in early 1781. So here we can have, we have a recap of, uh, of the numbers of black soldiers uh, in the Rhode Island regiments uh, from 1777 to 1781. Um, again, you can see the 17.5% of, uh, of the two regiments in uh, October, 1777. Uh, with the when the Black Rhode Island Regiment was formed, you can see the, the its strength at the beginning: 188 Black soldiers uh, plus uh, five Indians and four with mixed Indian African Indian African American blood. Um, so that's 188 Black soldiers in August 1778, 147 in September 17, 1779, down to 124 Black and Indian soldiers in June 1780. At that point, the regiment was disbanded. It was formed into two large companies and served uh, in their home state uh, until January 1781. Um, and of course, that was when they were consolidated with the 2nd Rhode Island Regiment to, to form the single Rhode Island Regiment. Now, by September, we, we have a, a return as the, uh, as the Rhode Island Regiment was on its way to Yorktown in uh, September 1781. Um, and those two large uh, segregated companies numbering 108 privates were incorporated into the Rhode Island regiments and kept as segregated companies. Um, adding black musicians and soldiers on other duty at that time, soldiers of color comprised 29.29% or 29 of the regiment. Uh, so it's, it's much larger than the 17.5% uh, that you saw in October, 1777. And it must have impressed um, the viewers, uh, anyone who, who had seen that regiment at the time. Now, before we move on uh, from the Rhode Island Regiment, um, a bit more about the unit. The segregated Rhode, first Rhode Island Regiment was an outlier, an experiment board of necessity in an army of integrated regiment or units. The experiment was largely un unsuccessful, but through no fault of its own. The fact that the regiment remained seriously under strength for the entire term of, of its existence was largely due to the legislature cutting off slave enlistment only four months after it was begun. Still in the 19th century, the Black Regiment became a symbol and example of African-American ability as soldiers and was seen by many as the precursor to the United States colored regiments that were formed during our Civil War. Next, we've seen how slavery um, while we've seen how slavery could affect free blacks after the war, uh, even serving soldiers were not immune to that threat. A late war soldier civilian confrontation emphasizes the perils black soldiers were, were exposed to, even from their fellow revolutionaries. Free black Fortune Stoddard began his military career with the integrated Rhode Island 1786 month state battalion. Reenlisting in the 1781 Rhode Island Regiment that December after the Yorktown siege, he and a number of other Rhode Island soldiers were quartered on the first floor of a home in, at Hellebelk, Maryland. Upstairs, a group of seamen were celebrating. Inebriated, their captain, James Cunningham, descended to the first floor and commenced abusing the soldiers, particularly Stoddard, who he assaulted with his fists and a small round chair. Private Stoddard called on the captain deceased, and at that point, Connecticut Captain Ebenezer Wales entered and confronted Cunningham, who in turn threatened Wales. Wales had the seamen ousted at the point of the bayonet. Cunningham and his men returned the next day and demanded alcohol from the homeowner, which she refused. The sound of breaking furniture, 
threw two unarmed Rhode Islanders upstairs. One was knocked to the floor and Benjamin Blanchard, a white private, retreated downstairs. So here we can see that there were African-Americans and, and white soldiers uh, all boarded in the same house. They were not segregated, even though they were in different companies. When the seamen followed him down, the rest of the soldiers were ready with loaded muskets and fixed bayonets. One white private aimed at Captain Cunningham's chest, but a seaman seized the weapon from the soldier, upon which the captain grabbed it and struck the soldier's head. At this, at this point, Private Sodder fired, hitting Cunningham in the groin, a wound that proved mortal. Fortune Stoddard was arrested and tried for murder, for murder in a Cecil County, Maryland civil court. He was eventually convicted of manslaughter and sentenced to be branded, specifically burnt in the brawn of the left thumb with a hot iron. That being done, Stoddard was still required to pay court costs, but not having the funds to do so, he remained confined. Finally, in the, the county government settled on the solution uh, to his unpaid uh, court costs that Stoddard be sold into slavery to pay his debt. Fortunately, the Rhode Island commander brought the case to General Washington's attention, and eight months after the incident, the Continental Congress decided that the state of Maryland be requested the discharge from confinement, Fortune Stoddard, a soldier belonging to the Rhode Island Regiment, confined for costs accrued in the late prosecution, and charged such costs to the United States, in order that the same may be charged as a said soldier and deducted out of his pay. Uh, that may seem to have been the end of the case, but it, it, it wasn't. Uh, but before we, we go to the end, uh, let's talk about a similar case that occurred in April 1781. Rhode Island Private Prince Green, this is September, September 1781, was on nighttime guard duty in Providence when he spotted and challenged someone near his post. Calling for a post that person to halt and not being complied with, Green fired and killed 23-year-old uh, Edward Allen. Green, an African-American, was arrested by civil authorities and charged with murder. The death of a citizen at the hands of a soldier would have produced a tumult in Providence, but that the soldier was black and his victim white most likely added to the uproar. The trial was held on county court four days after the shooting and Prince Green was convicted of manslaughter. His sentence was to receive an M-shaped brand on his hand and to pay all court costs. Green soon returned to his regiment and served to the end of the war. So you can see the similarities between uh, Green's case and Stoddard's case. Fortune Stoddard never reappeared on his regiment's muster rolls and was likely confined to the war's end. He did eventually return, return to Rhode Island and lived in Newport, where he married, raised a family, and by eight father was working as a chimney, a chimney sweep. So as far as we know, Stoddard remained in, in, uh, in prison until the end of the war, um, which would have been uh, a full year and a half, um, maybe even two years, after he was uh, arrested. Now that both Greens and Stoddard's murder charges resulted in manslaughter convictions that did not, not require confinement. Now they were charged with murder, but they, they, they were convicted of manslaughter. It did not require confinement, uh, speaks to some fairness in the jury's deliberations, despite the, the then common, but to us barbaric send, uh, uh, sentence of branding. The most telling and horrifying result is the Cecil County, County governments that's their suggestion that Fortune Stoddard be sold into slavery to pay the owed court costs. Beyond any other opinions on the matter, no white soldier could be subjected to the same solution. I now want to speak of the African-American women who, by their own free will or the will of others, served with the army. And to correct the popular idea of army women, black and white, they were by and large respectable and respected. Any woman any women who were not, were not long tolerated. I've discovered a number of black women with the army, some of them servants. One of those was Hannah Till, who served in General Washington's military household, um, mostly as a cook, and gave birth to a son at Valley Forge. Another was Sarah, a slave who emancipated herself and her son and joined the 1st Maryland Regiment uh, for several months in 1778. But I wanna focus on one woman, uh, Judith Lines, and read a portion of a letter written to her by her husband published for the first time in They Were Good Soldiers. Before I go on, I must say that there are two other existing letters from a Continental Army Black soldiers, one of them enslaved and the other a freedman. Both men could not write and dictated their missives, missives uh, for someone else to write. And the letters were not sent to family. One letter was written to the slave soldier's master while the other was to the soldier's former owners. To preface the, uh, to preface, uh, the lines letter, uh, John Lines enlisted in the 5th Connecticut Regiment in March 1781 for three years. Part of his time was spent at West Point and other Hudson Highland posts. 
By Judith Lyon's own testimony, they married in July, 1781. And she recalled the next summer, 1782, after I married, he sent for me to come to him. I think the place was called the Highlands. At, at that time, my husband was a waiter for Colonel Sherman. And while at the camp, I had the smallpox. I think I stayed about three or four months. Uh, if anybody's familiar with the smallpox, um, it's a horrific disease and can lift you, leave you scarred for life uh, if you survive. Mrs. Lyons noted in a pension application, my husband used to write to me when, I was, when he was in the army and I have one of his letters now in which I give to the magistrate who takes this by deposition. It is dated November 11th, 1781 and is in the handwriting of my husband. So now the letter. I take this opportunity to send to you my dear and loving wife to let you know that I am well and hoping these lines may find you and the children well. This is the sixth letter of mine and I haven't received one. I belong to Colonel Isaac Sherman's regiment, Captain Rice's company. We lay at Fishkill now. I'd be very glad if you would send me a letter how you have lived this summer and whether the house is done and whether you killed that cow or whether you got another. I want to know all these things very much. I intend to come home this winter if I can, but don't know if I can. If I could see you myself, then I could talk with you, my dear wife, as I like. I have seen hard times. I have lived with the bread, lived 11 days with bread only. I remain your loving husband until death, John Lines. So we can see a few, uh, we can take a few things from this letter and, and from the pension account. Um, first of all, uh, Judith Lines was home with three, uh, three children. Uh, she'd been married before. She had yet to have children with John Lines, um, but she had three, three children from a former marriage. So she was, she was taking care of the house uh, and homestead um, and everything related to it uh, pretty much by herself, probably with the help of, help of family and maybe some uh, neighbors. Um, also, John Lines could write. Uh, that may not have been common uh, with Southern uh, African-Americans um, and possibly more common in the North. Now, Lines and other veterans uh, re returned home to a changed and changing nation. Despite the waning of Northern slavery, with the ratification of the 1789 United States Constitution and boosted by the 1794 Cotton Gin Patent, Black bondage was cemented as a political and economic fact and detrimental racial attitudes hardened before, but more especially after 1800. 35 years after the war, black revolutionary veterans, along with their white comrades, were eligible for service pensions. But even in that system, they experienced, not all of them, but some experienced the effect of increasing bias. When all was said and done, African-American military service was a direct challenge to slavery and the racial construct and an affront to many white citizens. Still, black Americans continued to fight for their nation as 81-year-old Judith Lyons related in 1837, a youngest son, out of a wound received in the last war, the War of 1812. His name was Benjamin. The wound was received at the Battle of Chippewa, July 5, 1814. And Black Revolutionary veterans remained proud of their service, as attested by Artillo Freeman, who in his pension application valued all his belongings at $15.75. At the end of the list, he added one more item, revolutionary uniform, invaluable. And in closing, We'll turn to a white private, uh, a former private, uh, Henry Hallowell, um, formerly of the 5th Massachusetts Regiment. He gave this simple uh, but fitting tribute to African-American soldiers, free and slave, um, and it, it fits all who uh, served the revolutionary cause in a number of roles. In my company, there was four Negroes named Jephthah Ward, Job Upton, Douglas Middleton, and Pomp Simmons. Part of them called on me after their time was out. They were good soldiers. And oops, before I close, uh, this is, uh, we can, you can get some more information here. Um, the first is a, uh, a, a small compendium of, of articles uh, you can access online. Uh, the second is a list of my work, which uh, includes women with the army, um, soldier food, soldier shelter, uh, battle and campaign studies, unit studies. And if you have any questions, uh, you can email me uh, also. Um, and that's the conclusion of my uh, presentation. Thank you. Well, thank you, John. Uh, that was a great, uh, once again, uh, John Reese, uh, one of the leading 
authorities on African American and experience in the, in the American Revolution. Uh, we do have two questions uh, in the chat for you, John, uh, both from uh, Jim. One is if you have visited the National Museum of African American History and Culture, can you comment on how they depict the experience in the Rev War? Unfortunately, I have yet to uh, visit that museum, but it's on my list of things to do. Um, but I, I hope, I hope these have, they've avoided uh, a lot of the myths and gone gone for what we know of the true story, because the true story, to my mind, is much better than the myths. Um, and you know, you get more to the more to the the heart of uh, of the story of, of the of the people who really. Uh, participated. I mean, a lot of, too many people have, have actually uh, caught on to that, um, that one French officer's uh, estimate of 25% of the army being black soldiers. That's way too high. Um, and there's nothing else to corroborate that. Uh, but even though it wasn't 25% of the army, you know, that's, that's another one of the myths out there. Um, just the, the mere fact of their service and that they, that they served even in a higher proportion than their actual proportion in the in the populace, at least for free blacks, is, is amazing. So I, I hope they I hope they steer clear of the myths. I really do, and I and I think they did because they they from everything I've I've heard of they've they've done a wonderful job uh, at there, and I, I look forward to visiting at some point. Uh, yeah, and then also from Jim is uh, did any black veterans receive land in the Northwest Territories? Uh, yes, they did. Um, as a matter of fact, there is one. One uh, family-owned property that's still in uh, is actually in Western Pennsylvania, um, and it's it's under a land trust now. And uh, I think it's it came from came from two soldiers. One of them who was killed. One of them was killed at the uh, at the Battle of Wyoming um, in 1778, and uh, it's it's still owned by by uh, an African American family. Um, like I said, it's, it's under a trust now. Um, and if anybody's interested in that, I can give them the link. Uh, you can, you can, I think, I think you can actually visit the property now. Um, but yes, they, but, but, but like most veterans, um, especially most enlisted veterans, uh, they probably sold those land, those land, uh, patents for, uh, pittance, uh, and never ended up going and taking charge of them. Um, but yeah, they, they, they would have received their, their land bounty, uh, alongside white and Indian soldiers who served. Perfect. And so, uh, well, once again, thanks, John, for uh, sharing your research, uh, your uh, vast knowledge. Uh, for all those who missed the beginning, uh, John is also the author of They Were Good Soldiers, African-Americans Serving in the Continental Army, 1775 to 1783. Uh, it was published in 2019, available from uh, Amazon and other uh, booksellers there. Um, his email is also in the chat as well if you have any questions about him uh, or for him. Um, and so once again, thanks, John. Um, and we'll see you uh, in a little bit over an hour, right, for the uh, panel. So yep. Yeah, looking forward to it. I appreciate it. With that, I'll hand it over. Liz, are we going, I guess, on a break, right? We're going to we're gonna do a break, but for those who want um, the signed book plate of John, so you can have an official authored signed book, then um, he has a signed book, book plates that he can mail you. So we've dropped John's email in the chat. So if you would like a signed book plate, then um, please email John and he can um, hook you up with that. And they'll, and they'll also, uh, if they, uh, if they, Want that signed book plate? I'll also include some other little goodies on in there with some additions to the book and uh, things like that. So, hey, <laughs> hey, extra go. goodies! I dig it. <laughs>